Ah, welcome to the Backyard Professor videos. I'm Kerry Schertz, the Backyard Professor. I'm just uh, up above my house. It's just starting to sunset. And uh, I've decided I'm going to do a quick video or two on this subject of steel as a, as a general idea for steel in the Book of Mormon. The, uh, the challenge has been thrown out that steel wasn't known until 300 B.C. And of course what this does is it presents a supposed problem for the Book of Mormon, assuming the information is correct, and it's not. And it also presents a problem for the Bible, assuming again that the information is correct, and it's not. Uh, this is as easy as falling off a log, folks. <laughs> Whenever you're given a challenge, what you do is you tra-la-la-la-la down to the library, and you look up the subject, steel, and in this case, I looked up uh, Biblical Archaeology and Steel, found several books. I'm going to do a video series on Biblical Archaeology this weekend, I hope, for uh, Chick Dirio, who is a very intelligent lady. And uh, so I'm going to honor her with a series of videos as well um, on a wonderful subject, Biblical Archaeology. But tonight I want to talk about steel. I have been accused of misunderstanding uh, the nature of steel. And... There's no evidence. All of the scholars scream and holler. They say, uh, I'm wrong, and they're right. I'm just a dumb Mormon. They, them, they know. You, you just a dumb Mormon. So this dumb Mormon <laughs> went to the library. Hey, it'll amaze you what you can find in the library. <laughs> in that case, I found a few books. This is by Karen Ray Nemet Najat. This is Daily Life in Ancient Mesopotamia. Greenwood Press, let's see, uh, 1998. Not too old. She notes that the metals known and used in the ancient Near East were copper, tin, bronze, which is an artificial alloy of copper and tin, gold, silver, electrum, which is a natural alloy of gold and silver, Lead, iron, and steel, an artificial alloy of iron and carbon. She says this on page 293. I'll always give you my sources. This is one thing I love about videos, is I can always present my sources to you. And of course, as a good backyard professor, I don't know anything, but these people I'm reading do. And I'm going to seriously encourage you to look these people up. Make sure I'm reading them right also. But I will always give you my sources. I'm not going to merely assert. I'm going to demonstrate. That's what a backyard professor does. Page 294, she says, The Iron Age began 1200 BCE. Through, though miscellaneous pieces of iron have been found in archaeological contexts as far back as the 5th millennium BC, the Hittites used iron metallurgy in their military successes, particularly against the Egyptians at the Battle of Kadesh in Syria. This was 1275 BC. When the Hittite Empire fell at the end of the Bronze Age, control over the use of iron and iron technology fell to the Philistines. Iron became the metal of choice for the common man. I'm trying to keep track of this sunset. It's really quite beautiful. At the beginning of the second millennium BC, iron and nickel content was known in Eastern Asia Minor, and iron was considered more valuable than gold. However, large-scale use of iron began when the Hittites succeeded in smelting iron ore and applying appropriate alloys. Iron technology is more complex than the processes for smelting copper and making bronze. Forging could produce wrought iron, which is almost free of carbon, making it more malleable, and wrought iron can be made to absorb more carbon by reheating it in a furnace in contact with carboniferous materials. To give the resultant metal its maximum hardness, it has to be suddenly cooled by quenching it in water or oil in order to become steel. Iron came into widespread use when iron metallurgists had mastered these processes. She's talking about the Assyrians, which other scholars I have date back to 900 B.C. They understood these processes. Archaeological evidence for metal workshops has been rare. Only two early millennium B.C. shops are known. But that doesn't mean 
it wasn't understood as a process. It was understood as a process. Oh, uh, there goes the sun. It's a bright, clear evening tonight. No really gorgeous clouds. So unfortunately, you get a look at my ugly mug. Between 650 and 600 BC, the kingdom of Urartu has a center of metal artwork where new techniques were continuously developed. And then, and that's on page uh, 294. So there's one source. Now, another source I want to get to you. I was also accused of using a pro-biblical archaeological source. And that's not fair, you know. They have their bias. I want a real scientist, someone who's not interested in proving the Bible. In a way, I can understand that concept. I've got to show you these clouds. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt this real quick. And a major interruption so the backyard professor can show you the sunset. Woohoo! I am such a nice guy to do this for you guys. Sun just went down that mountain. Hey, that's the diamond. I've camped under that mountain. Yeah, there's the diamond in all its glory. Sun right behind it. Boy, that's beautiful. You can sure see the diamond shape, can't you? So there's another Idaho sunset. Let me zip and do doo over here real quick. I know this is really amateur. Sorry. Well, those clouds were... Those clouds were quite beautiful. Those clouds are quite beautiful. I love clouds. I can't help it. Anyway, there's the sunset. Right behind the diamond. Boy, we are talking amateur hour, aren't we? Ay, ay, ay. Now it's got... Oh, hey. I gotta focus out. Yeah, oh hey, that's too big. That's too close. Holy cow. Scare the camera with that. Douglas Allen Fisher, The Epic of Steel. So, if biblical archaeologists don't count, and they do, it's just a simple gimmick. You know, I'm going to accept the evidence where the evidence lays. Whichever scholar, I don't care if it's a, uh, I don't care if it's a Christian archaeologist, I don't care if it's a Mormon archaeologist, I don't care if it's a Buddhist, I could care less if it's an atheist. That's irrelevant. What is the evidence? That's what I'm interested in. Hey, I'm the backyard professor. I insist on seeing evidence and seeing good analysis of all the evidence. With this idea in mind, there is no finality in archaeology. That's what my archaeology videos are going to be about this weekend. Chapter 3 in Douglas Allen Fisher, The Epic of Steel. Steel and in antiquity. Page 21. In reading the references to steel, it's well to bear in mind that many ancient languages had several words for steel, or they used the same word to denote both iron and steel. Are you getting this? The same word can refer to both iron and steel, and even non-ferrous metals. What generally passed for steel was probably, with some exceptions, carburized or case-hardened iron, with which we became familiar in the last chapter. He talked all about iron in the chapter before. Weapons antedating 1000 B.C., in other words, weapons that are older than 1000 B.C., have been found with the points or the blades of nearly glass-like hardness, the result of quenching high-carbon iron. To the ancients, that is steel. Now, it may not be our modern definition of steel, but the ancients called it steel. 